All right. Hey guys, we're back again. Had some technical stuff on my, on my end, but anyways, we're back. Um, I'm Sean. I'm going to talk to to Aston, Claire, and Ellie who are here to see me. So thank y'all for showing up. Um, I'm just letting you know. Uh, but <laughs> we are going to talk about blood flow restriction training today and the science and the application of blood flow restriction. The reason we're going to talk about it is it's been around for a long time. It's been long for around for about 35 years now. Um, started in China and then came over here and was adopted by a guy named Johnny Owens who did a lot of research on how to strengthen the residual limb of an amputee. And it was really hard to find that so he stumbled across blood flow restriction and some of the uh, stuff coming out from China from it. But incredible research behind it, some things like seeing a 400% increase in human growth hormone and able to sustain that, seeing an incredible 200% increase in testosterone, just some incredible things happening in blood flow restriction. And we're going to talk about it based from a rehab perspective and from a training perspective. So we're going to get into to both of them okay so what is blood flow restriction and this is why I wanted my notes to pull up so I have the exact definition blood flow restriction is the brief and intermittent occlusion of restriction of arterial and venous blood flow that is performed by applying a tourniquet to the upper and lower extremity um, it has been found to augment skeletal muscle adaptation along with systemic whole body changes and cardiovascular benefits while at rest and it has been found to be here's the number one question we get all the time is it safe it's been found to be very very safe actually there are some things we're going to talk about at the end of when not to use blood flow restriction but those are very in the in the rare side of things so overall it's very very safe so let, what we will not be getting into is actual fitting for the cuffs because each one of these cuffs has um, for yourself and your body there's an individual measurement that is based off of you exactly for your arterial pressure for the width of your thigh for the width of your arm for whoever your genetic there's a there's an uh, exact fit for that and how to target heart rate we're not gonna get into that stuff and um, but Aston's gonna be my example at the end. We're gonna pump up his. You said arms. Okay, we're gonna pump the biceps up then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he, did, he, did, he didn't want to do a lower body pump. He wanted the, he wanted the upper body pump. Uh, all right. So the mechanisms and benefits of blood flow restriction training. Um, there is a ton. So we're gonna get into. There's two biggest we're gonna talk about today, and this is the first one: um, local skeletal muscle adaptation. Um, Number one is cell swelling. So some of the things with cell swelling, that is hypertrophy. That is when you're working out, your, your muscles are getting bigger, your muscles are building. Um, the things with cell swelling, there is a protein complex called MTORC1, and this has a massive effect in hypertrophy. So the effect, this effect of blood flow restriction stimulates that protein, and by increasing MTORC1, we can reduce the rate of lost muscle due to disuse or atrophy. So this is when you hear the people who are laying in the hospital beds in a coma, and they can't move, they can't do anything, their, their muscles atrophy away, they lose the size of their muscle, literally. Well, when they compared this to folks who do blood flow restriction training they don't lose anything and they actually see hypertrophy so it's it's pretty incredible what this thing can do we're talking about the, the science and the reasoning why behind it in a little bit um, another thing with it and you might have heard about this is uh, something called myostatin it's a negative muscle skeletal protein synthesis regulator um, it's part of the scar tissue family it has to do with healing um, but this can be inhibited by the lactate release during blood flow restriction so to get to go over the common science behind it with blood flow restriction what happens is we are occluding the flow of blood to an area when we occlude the flow of blood let's say for the lower extremity we're shooting for about an 80 percent occlusion whenever we're occluding the blood what happens is the energy cycle that has to fire off to fire the big muscle fibers that don't use oxygen so we're cutting out the anaerobic of the aerobic system we're bypassing the aerobic system because we're burning up all the oxygen there's literally not as much oxygen getting to the muscle fibers because it's not able to because of the tourniquet that's on so when that happens we're going straight to the energy systems that only use that are anaerobic they don't use oxygen so therefore we're getting into a lot of those type 2 type 2b fibers the most powerful fibers we have that's what we're using during blood flow restriction because it's our only option it's all we got so when you continue to fire those energy cycles that fire the big type 2b fibers the big type 2 fibers what happens is your body secretes a whole lot of two substances a byproduct of the energy cycles that you're using that is lactate and that is hydrogen Okay, a lot of folks have heard about um, the reason why I bogged out when I worked, when I was working out is because my lactate levels got too high. I bypassed my lactate threshold. The lactate is really not the problem. It's really the hydrogen. The hydrogen becomes the trash in the muscles that causes some of this. The lactate is actually a 
a positive effect overall. What happens is when the body detects all this lactate in your blood, the pituitary gland picks it up and it responds by secreting a linearly equal amount of human growth hormone. So when you have all that lactate in your bloodstream, human growth hormone is secreted systemically throughout the body thanks to the pituitary gland. Okay, so we're occluding the limb to decrease the oxygen. After we decrease the oxygen, we burn up our aerobic system. Our anaerobic systems kick in, which allows, those are our big, powerful fibers. Think about a sprinter. And then all of a sudden, because we're burning up those type 2 fibers, and that's all we have to use, our lactate levels go up, and the body responds by increasing human growth hormone, which is the number one recovery tool we have. And then, as a response, testosterone is released, not linearly, but... Um, about 50% as much human growth hormone. So if you have 400% increase in human growth hormone, it's about 200% increase in testosterone. These are things you don't see during normal conditions. Yes? Is the testosterone the same for women and men? Yeah, well, the same increase. So obviously women are gonna have less testosterone you know, at, on a controlled level, but as far as when you use the cuffs, it's pretty much the same increase as a, as a guy would see. Uh, guys relative. would have, guys, yeah, relative. I think guys actually have a little bit more. Okay. Um, but not not significantly, not much. Um, but yeah, so but you're still having a huge increase. But we don't see these gains. When, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. When you compare this to regular high intensity interval training, which is what CrossFit is, any type of huge effort, you see an uptick in human growth hormone, but not nearly as substantial as a blood flow restriction, and at much less areas of exertion. You don't have to go out all out with blood flow restriction, and you still see incredible incredible results with it so we're going to talk about that in a little bit but um sorry i went off on a tangent but to go off uh, a little bit further so number two metabolic induced fatigue strength that is getting stronger that's building um that's what i was saying earlier that low oxygen and lactate also play a role in muscle recruitment where when we when we are fatiguing a muscle and not allowing it to use oxygen we are firing our powerful fibers our sprinting fibers our type 2b fibers the fibers that make you big that's what we're firing um it has an incredible effect. Talk about satellite cell, MPS, muscle health, and hypoxia for nutrient delivery. We use this in rehab a lot. Any type of muscle strain, tear, um, any type of, there's so many things we can use this for. It has an incredible, uh, it's an incredible resource for us. But for a muscle to regrow, it needs to rebuild and into a stronger, more resilient state than it has previously had. Um, with bluff, when we do a high intensity exercise, if we do it four, five, six days a week, we're doing more damage than we're actually building. So we're, we're causing, if we're going, if we're redlining all those days, we're doing a little bit more damage. With blood flow restriction training, you never seem to hit a red line with it. If you ever have tried it, if you go and you lift heavy, and then the next day you're sore and the day after that you're sore. Blood flow restriction, you really don't get sore. And it's so counterintuitive because if you've ever done it, it's brutal. But the next day you're not very sore. It's, it's really odd because it's feeding the muscle what it needs. It's not letting it go over the limits that it, it needs to go over. And then bone growth. Anytime we have someone with osteoporosis, um, we are going to try to train them into using a blood flow restriction um, program because it is absolutely amazing what it can do for bone growth. Um, we're seeing people who, they've done studies where someone has an entirely uh, fractured femur. The, the femur snapped in half and they will do blood flow restriction training for a control group, someone who doesn't get it and someone who does get it, and the person with the snap femur, it actually heals and actually goes back together with blood flow restriction training. It does that anyways, but it takes twice the amount of time for someone who does it. So fascinating stuff. A little research note down here. Um, <clears throat> the blood flow restriction training groups can see a 30 to 50% increase in muscle fiber area within the first four to eight weeks during and post training. That's insane, considering high intensity training groups on average see a 15 to 20% increase in muscle fiber area after 12 to 16 weeks. So you're seeing in literally half or a third of the amount of time, you're seeing a 50% a increase versus a 15 to 20% increase in, in two extra cycles, which is insane to think about. <clears throat> okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is systemic adaptation. This is where it gets just crazy some of the things we're seeing so for one a cardiovascular system adaptation y'all and i'll include vo2 max in there vo2 max is something that is is incredibly genetic you actually you don't we never thought you could see much of an improvement in your vo2 max beyond a certain percentage 
With blood flow restriction, we are seeing, and I think it's right here, this, this increase in heart rate can be seen with this study that had individuals train well below the 50% VO2 max and time duration recommendations. While still seeing positive change in not just VO2 max, but also in muscle strength and size, our two outcomes not associated. So people were able to cardiovascular train, able to um, do some type of aerobic event, and normally you don't see any muscle growth. With, when they were doing blood flow restriction, they were getting bigger and their VO2 max was improving. But you see incredible things with uh, like the, the walking group. At 45% heart, they took a group of, uh, of basketball players and they made them walk three times a week, 15 minutes per session. This is all, that's all they did. Three times a week of walking, 15 minutes per session. And after, I think it was four, they did, I guess it was four to five days per week, but six to 10 weeks later, oh, that's a strength thing. No, it was a basketball group. But anyways, their VO2 max went up by like 15% just by walking three days a week. And VO2 max is something we didn't think we could manipulate a whole lot, which is insane to think about. Um, the soft tissue repair, we talked about that a little bit a minute ago, how whenever uh, uh, blood flow restriction training just doesn't let you go to those bonking limits where you're doing muscle damage, it actually allows them to repair very quickly whenever they're doing it. Um, again, we use it for tendon repair, we use it for muscle damage, reduced pain, because we're getting such an, uh, an increased amount of uh, human growth hormone and testosterone, it does nothing but help the muscle recover, it does nothing but help build strength and um, <clears throat> add more to the muscle as far as nutrients go. And this was the, I guess this was the cycling thing. I said, yeah, with blood flow restriction training at 40% of their VO2 max, they performed it three times per week for 15 minutes. Over an eight week period, this increased their absolute VO2 max by 6.4% and a 15.4% improvement in time to fatigue, which is inc incredible. Um, the control group at 40% VO2 max riding for 45 minutes had no change. So no change versus a 6.4% increase in your VO2 max is absolutely insane to think about. Um, let's see. Yeah, so on the cardio, let me see this next slide. Yeah, so on the cardiovascular, the systemic adaptation, this is what's insane. If you look at the research right there, the blood flow restriction training when combined with exercise increases lactate by 290% from your baseline. And lactate is the stimulant that creates human growth hormone. That's absolutely ridiculous, which is 1.7 times higher than just regular resistance training, um, which is huge for when we are doing rebuilding. And so rehab is rebuilding a muscle, but strength training is rebuilding a muscle as well if it's done correctly. So that's where blood flow restriction comes in huge. Um, for tendon repair, these are a lot of research. So the blood flow restriction group with tendon repair had a 5.8 fold increase in muscle collagen synthesis. Collagen is like the superstructure of the body. It's the go-between for everything. Um, the control group had no change. The, so the next study, HGH group increased tendon stiffness and collagen uh, synthesis with blood flow restriction training. The group who did the same thing but did not blood flow restriction train had no change. And then you can see here for a fracture to close, it required 95 days with blood flow restriction training. With no blood flow restriction training, it was 129 days. So you're landing a whole nother month to the timetable. It's a lot of difference there. Okay. Heart rate reserve. Yeah, so as far as getting into the, the muscle damage side of things and reduce pain, I mean, with this thing, with the cross, just from every standpoint, you can create strength, you can create cardiovascular endurance. Um, it allows your body to, to do things with that normally take a lot more time. Instead of going through a three month cycle of a strength build with blood flow restriction training, we can go through a month cycle and see very similar results, which cuts times timetables in half or by a third, really. All right, let's see. So the mechanism, kind of in a nutshell, what does blood flow restriction training do? It preserves muscle mass and strength through enforcing activity. It improves bone density and function. It increases muscle size and strength, improved aerobic capacity, improved recovery, and it actually reduces pain, and it repairs the body for high-intensity training. So let's talk about, none of my videos are working, um, but we're gonna talk about, the, there's three main methods that we use in, I'm going to go ahead and get you to hop up, Aston. There's three main methods that we use when we do um, blood flow restriction training. So one of those methods, yeah, you might just want to pick it up and kind of video this, Ellie. But I know. But, um, oh, we're, you want to do the arm pump, not the leg pump. Let me see this.
<laughs> and this is where it's going to get good. So we're going to apply the cuffs. Now you can face me. We're going we're gonna to apply the cuffs and we're going to put them on Aston. Let's see here. So there's two different sites that you always do the cuffs at. So scoot back a little bit. Okay, we're good. Uh, there's two different sites. We normally, we do them here, proximal humerus or thigh. Okay, proximal in the hip flexor area. All right, so, and when you do one, you always want to do the other one because there's really no reason not to. Um, but I will say this, the reason why blood flow restriction training has such, it does create such an improvement in a heart rate and it decreasing your heart rate and increasing the cardiovascular capacity. When you are occluding a limb as much as we are, your stroke volume has to go up adequately. For each limb that you occlude, your stroke volume goes up about 12%. So A, I'm never going to include all four limbs because that's a huge load on the heart, okay? But if we include two, think about the equations for cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate. Therefore, your cardiac output is going to skyrocket, but it's a beneficial skyrocket. It's not a detrimental. So we are going to put these on the bicep, put them around here. It's going to be a little too big. You might be too scrawny for this. Dang. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a smaller size. Sorry, Aston. Sorry. We're going right to find his like, max occlusive pressure, right? We're going to do that in a second. Oh, you're you're going to do all that, yeah. So, so if like, so like the one we're going to do is for biceps, but you could do it for triceps. Like you could do it for any like hamstrings, quads, or is it only work like certain, is there only ways to work certain muscle groups? No, no, no. So here's the thing. Um, when we do this, you are going to have a pump because we're going to do this primarily going after your bicep. Right. We'll do it for the bicep. You're going to have a pump through the bicep and right. probably the tricep too. But the HGH, the, the release of human growth hormone, that right. is systemic. Okay. So your whole, so we'll actually do, if we're rehabbing with someone who, let's say we've got someone post-op in a cast or right. in an immobilizer, we'll go ahead and do, do a blood flow restriction because we have a huge recovery going to the area that we can't even get to right now. Um, yeah. So it's So does it matter? Phenomenal. So does it really matter like what you're training when you, like, so we're going to do biceps right now, right? Mm -hmm. But does it does it really matter what we're training per like se? Yes. Yes. Like, versus yeah, like versus squats. like squats. Yes, it matters because while the HGH is systemic mm -hmm. throughout your entire body, the specific muscle repair areas, so like HGH is going to repair areas right. anyways, but the thing that's getting the work is going to be the thing that's receiving most of the benefits. Okay. So bicep, if we do dips, it could be the tricep, okay. but also we can do it. Let's say someone and I was talking about this today with Claire, let's say uh, someone doesn't, like they're not able to really access their glutes very right. much, and it could be for a ton of different reasons. Well, we'll blood flow restrict, and we'll just knock their quads out, because it's gonna fatigue their quads big time, right. allowing us to get more into the glutes mm -hmm. after we've already blood flow restricted. Um, but yeah, so it's a systemic increase in human growth hormone, but it's more of a localized increase in testosterone as well. So because it's going after where the muscle is being, uh, being damaged or rebuilt. Right. Okay, so Aston's got the cuffs on, we got them on pretty tight, and I'm gonna find, let's see what Aston, <clears throat> just for Ellie to video this easily, have a seat. So we got our cuffs here, we're gonna put some gel on Aston's wrist, we're gonna find his radial pulse. We're gonna use the Doppler to do it. So if you wanna know if it was a boy or a girl, we're about to find out. Oh man, I'm pregnant. <laughs> if I can get this thing to go in there. Come on. There we go. All right, so, yeah, I don't want to take those off. I'm gonna kind of put it globally around here. It's come out the side on me. That's why I have the tape on there. Just making noises. All right, so hold this for me for a second, if you don't mind. I'm gonna put the pressure cuff on here. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna find Aston's pulse. And after we found his pulse, there she is. So nervous. <laughs> 
hopefully you guys can hear this. I'll put the mic closer. Thank you. Okay, so you can hear. I feel like I'm so close to your heart right now. I feel like I'm getting closer. Okay, so we are going to maximally occlude Aston's pulse, his blood flow to his arm. So you heard it go away. There she is. So around 122, so I'm gonna include it again just to check. Come back down. Yep, so 122 is Aston's maximal occlusion pressure for his right arm, okay? That's gonna be generally right for the left arm. So if 122 is the max for the upper extremity, we like to do about a 50 to 60% occlusion, okay? We're gonna do 50%.